so uh, before we begin, I just kind of wanted to talk about um, getting your own mod into or your own assets into uh, Source Filmmaker. So to do that, it just takes a few simple steps. Um, you have um, user mod, which is kind of like a dumping ground for all of the output of your uh, of your stuff there. Um, and you can also use it as kind of like a shell mod, kind of like an add-on in Gary's mod. But um, it starts out pretty simple. Um, when you launch it, you can either go directly into Source Filmmaker or you can launch the uh, SDK, which gives you the option to set which mod that you're about to use. By default, it's set to user mod, but you can create new mods as well. Um, nice thing about these new mods, let's say you create a new mod um, using the uh, utilities panel here. That's um, uh, using new mod or creating a mod. Um, you can, once you do that, you get basically this shell mod that has absolutely nothing in it. But um, once you create it, you'll get basically a gameinfo.txt and some folders to place all your stuff in. Your game info.txt is kind of like a series of um, prerequisites for that. Um, you can add as many as you'd like, and you can actually add the user mod to include the mods that you create. Right now, my user mod uses all of the sub mods that I have here, so when I boot up in user mod, it has all the files that I've put in. I've even done uh, symbolic links to other hard to other drives and everything, and I've uh, synced these up to where when I um, install new models, it goes into Gary's Mod and Source Filmmaker at the same time using symbolic links. I have an active add-on folder as well. Um, so I guess we'll boot up Source Filmmaker. So Let's see. I guess I won't talk to myself in a vacuum. All right. Let's see. Well, I guess we can boot it up then. So when you first boot up Source Filmmaker, you're going to get this uh, this screen right here. It's a uh, tutorial. Well, it's for this tutorial, it's going to be just named Tutorial 1. You can name it whatever you'd like. Um, I know it's a little weird thinking that you can name your project before you actually make it, but it really doesn't matter what you name it because you could, once you save it, you can save as and rename the file. Usually I just use a date stamp, like, um, you know, 2614 or something like that. So <clears throat> once you have the name picked out, you hit Create. You can also open up Recent Ones. Um, that will start up Source Filmmaker and essentially what this is right here. Um, you'll see that there's no map loaded and it's going to be pretty empty. Uh, the first thing that you're going to want to do is right click on the big black area where you normally have your screen. Um, that will give you a uh, option here to load up a map. You also have a few more options here and I'll go through them over the course of the uh, event here. So when you load map you'll get uh, and a BSP opener, um, or you know, just like a selection of things that you can open up with uh, your different mods and everything. 
Um, if you've created mods separately, they'll show up here. Uh, if not, you'll have TF Movies, TF, and um, User Mod. Uh, you could store everything in user mod and load everything up from user mod, but I like to split things up. That way, you get, um, you know, I've extracted all the assets for Counter Strike and Left 4 Dead, Portal, and everything like that. Um, you can also start by typing in a map name and uh, pulling up what you'd like. Um, so I have, for example, DE Wanda. I'll pull that up. Um, a quick caveat. Caveat about maps, they need to be HDNR enabled, HDR enabled. Um, but once you find one that is HDNR, HDR enabled, uh, you'll find um, that it will pull up correctly. If it's not, it will give you a warning and start up in full bright. I'd say that's probably the weakest part of Source Film Maker is that it absolutely will not work with these older maps. But if you'd like, you can pull up the best at, the best maps that work for Source Film Maker besides Steam Fortress are Portal maps, and they load up great. They look great. Um, I'd say that the Source Film Maker branch is closest to Portal. Um, so when you first load up your map, you're going to have essentially... Um, a floating camera and not much else. Uh, to navigate with your camera, you just hold down the mouse button and move the mouse around. WSAD works just fine. Um, so, of course, you know, if you know exactly what you want to do on the map in terms of poses, then you can navigate directly there. Um, if not, then uh, you could search around. It's not quite as, um, I'd say, fun as Gary's Mod when you want to find a place. You know, just kind of like running around the map until you find a good spot to pose. But um, it's just as intuitive. And actually, if you do really like map stuff, you can hit F11 on the keyboard, and that'll load up a game version here. And it's essentially the same as um, as an in-game thing. You basically generate as the scout and um, you run around the map. Um, generally this is used for um, in-game recording. I'm not really going to touch on that because that's really for animating and that's really only if you're animating a Team Fortress video. Um, but that's F11. Uh, also important thing to note here is if you like messing with things like fog controls, you have your full console here like you'd normally have and you hit F11 to get out of that. Um, if you shoot the walls, you are normally given a scatter gun. The bullet impacts will be maintained on the walls. Um, basically, it's a full recording. Um, so once you have a basic scene picked out, um, you'll have your basic interface to deal with now. So going, from, uh, going through, of course, you have the main viewport. You also have a direct uh, control of the console. Um, you'll have tabs for the animation set editor and the element viewer. All right. Uh, I add a secondary viewport, and I also add, have the timeline. Of course, you're going to have the timeline as well. Um, there's a few very important things to understand when using the timeline and uh, using the animation set editor because it's where you're going to spend the most time. Um, one, this plus button is going to be where you spawn anything. That's cameras, lights, models, particles if you'd like, and anything that already exists in the map that you can manipulate. Um, your timeline allows you to actually manipulate those. So I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So let's say you just go straight in and spawn a model right where you are pointing your camera. So you can pull up anything. Um, let's see, I guess I could pull up... Hmm, something that I've done. I'm just going to pull up a standard character from my science fiction pack. Here you go. Malo 6. So, he spawns directly in front of the camera. Now, if you notice, you have work camera here. And if you move around, at this point, now you have this, uh, this render box here. This is essentially like placing an external camera in Gary's Mod. Um to manipulate that camera because this is going to be your primary camera you need to go to the animation set editor hit the plus and add animation set for existing elements from there camera one will pop up you hit OK now you can control it 
Um, another thing that might be different, you might see the camera one pop directly up, is um, that you'll have, you can enable um, uh, scene hierarchy, which basically gives you folders and submenus that you can put things in. Um, it's a little bit better when you start dealing with bigger scenes. You can create and group objects as well. Um, but for the purposes of this, it's going to be a pretty simple thing. Um, now, if you notice, you can move around with the work camera, no problem. But if you select camera one and change your current camera, and this is going to the viewport here, and hitting change scene camera to camera one, the camera you just created, you won't be able to move it using the mouse. That's because you're in the uh, clip editor which is this editor right here that has um, this kind of blue purplish clip. The only way that you can manipulate things in real time is to switch to one of the other two editors. That's the motion editor or the keyframe editor. All right. The motion editor is um, just a basic um, thing that allows you to, uh, over time, edit the motion of an object. It's not that big of a deal when you're dealing with a single screenshot. And the keyframe editor, if you've ever dealt with any modeling programs, allows you to add keyframes. And it will move from frame one to frame two over time. Like I said, not that important if you're only worried with one frame in time. So once you're in the, um, the motion editor, I prefer the motion editor because it has a few less problems than the keyframe editor. Um, if you were to select the, a whole ragdoll in the keyframe editor, you could have unusual results, would be my best word for it. But once you're in the motion editor, you can select the model from your animation set editor, and you'll have um, all the bones highlighted. All right, And you'll see all these different lines here. That's actually the values of the particular bones. Um, you'll see, see them in the um, keyframe editor. Now, in the timeline mode, um, you'll be doing pretty much all the uh, movement here. Um, you can move things around using Valve's kind of multi-tool, but if you like the more traditional gizmos, you can hit, this is right over here, you can hit um, rotate and transform. And these are the traditional movement and rotation controls. And that allows you to have very fine movement of um, you know, where you want the actor. Now if you notice, if you still have camera one enabled and you try and move the camera around, um, you won't be able to do it because the only time you can move the camera is when you have it selected. So um, now that I have camera one selected in the animation set editor, I can actually adjust it. If you want to move the camera around without, if you want to move the viewport around without moving your camera, you'll have to hit um, the button right there where it says camera one, work camera. That allows you to uh, swap out between your work camera and your primary camera. So at this point you're starting to set up your simple scene. This is why I like having a secondary viewport because you can always see what your scene is going to look like. Um, basically you're going to want to frame what you're doing before you really get started. Of course you can move it afterwards, but it's a better workflow if you allow it to have um, your entire, uh, if you just give it one specific frame. Um, once you have your uh, work camera running and um, you're starting to manipulate the environment, um, you're going to actually want to move the, pro uh, the rag dolls and props around. So at this point, it really just comes down to grabbing um, the particular bones you'd like and placing them where you'd like in the scene. So this could be take some time, of course. It all depends on how you want to do it. Um, if you notice, uh, his mouth is already open and his eyes are looking to the side. Um, this is a very, very common issue that I've noticed with custom models in particular. The, um, the view target is broken. The way to solve this problem is to close SFM, save your scene, and reopen it, and he'll have his flexes ready to go. Um, 
if you notice here, uh, he has a whole selection in hierarchy. That's because this is on the valve biped, which means that they break down all the bones into subgroups. That's body, arms, fingers, legs, uh, a lot of things that you can manipulate, and as well as unknown. If the modeler created any bones that weren't normally included in the valve biped, then you should be good to go. Um, and it will be in here. That also includes unknown flexes. So, for example, if I were to load up a different model that isn't on the valve biped, pretty much everything is going to show up in unknown. So, let me try and do that. All right. Here's a SR-71 pilot. So notice one thing. The pilot spawns in front of the active camera. That's camera one, not your work camera. That is always going to be true. Whichever camera you have as the active scene camera is going to be where your model spawn. All right? If you notice the... Uh, the bone hierarchy isn't quite as pretty as it is for the standard citizen. You have like all the bones properly uh, shaped and everything. Here it's not the case. The hand, the, this is all determined by the actual names of the bones. So if you look, there are a few bones that match and there are some spine bones in there that are equivalent to the uh, source names, but most of it is un unknown. And um, it just comes down to where you got the model and how well it operates. So um, you can manipulate individual bones, of course, in the hierarchy, and everything works pretty self-explanatory in this way. Um, one important thing to note is that if you're moving a whole rag doll, you're going to want to grab them from um, their root bone, and that's going to be in body, and that's root transform. That will allow you to uh, manipulate the whole thing without messing up where it is. And a lot of times when you import animations that move the uh, pelvis up and down, the root transform will maintain the position. So it's simply an XYZ of where the model as, as a whole is. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So let's say that you have a basic pose set up. You're ready to go. Um, you want to get a little bit more into it and maybe um, do a little bit more modification to specific characters. If your character has been um, uh, built on the valve biped and has animations uh, built in, um, this would be like uh, something that would normally work as a player model or NPC. Um, you can actually import sequences. That's uh, right click, import, and sequence, and that'll pop up something very similar to Half-Life Model Viewer in that you have a whole selection of sequences that you can take a look at. Um, and for the most part, citizen sequences are pretty self-explanatory. They're idle, they're running, they're walking. Um, if you don't feel like posing every single bone, you could pull up an idle sequence that you like and um, apply it to the model and manipulate the model after the sequence has been loaded. So maybe he's just standing here, maybe in a more casual pose, but um, you don't want him to look like he's holding the gun because he's not holding the gun. So maybe just move it around a little bit. Let's see here. All right, let's see. Oh, and somebody asked if um, I could see the comments. I did not have the window open. So, um, yeah, if you have anything you'd like to ask, I am watching it now, so please do ask. Um, I'd rather not do this whole thing in a vacuum. <laughs> um, but um, like I was saying, um, once you uh, 
have your model imported, you can always manipulate based off the individual bones. Now, this is a little bit different than Gary's model, where you grab the end bone and you, um, you know, you just move it with the physics gun and everything, and it works a little floppily, but it works nonetheless. That's very similar to what uh, inverse kinematics is. And if your model is um, on a valve biped, then you can enable something very similar to. Um, to this as well. Um, if it has the correct uh, rig, then you can imp, uh, add an IK script. To do that, you have to right click on the model. All right, you'll have a menu here. What you're going to do is go to where it says rig, and then you're going to select rig biped simple. If you just started using SFM and you haven't built any custom rigs, that's really going to be the only one to choose. At this point, your model's going to change a little bit. Instead of having all your bones available, now you only have a few. All right. But on the plus side, you can actually move these around with the movement tool, and you'll be able to do some very interesting um, things that are more procedural. You know, you won't have to worry about exactly where the shoulder is. Um, you'll just be able to move things around that um, concern you. Um, there are a few caveats to using this, and the reason why I don't use this too often is because um, <laughs> it's sometimes not 100% perfect for one. Um, for two, you have all of your fingers basically hidden. You can't manipulate the fingers while you have your IK up and running. So if you want to do changes to that, uh, you'll, you would have to uh, un load your rig script and go back to the normal settings. To do that, you right click, go back to rig, and detach rig, and detach all. That will return it to the old version after um, it stops stuttering. And there we go. How does what work? Blend animations. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So you're talking about where you have um, an animation that works where you have um, maybe a running animation and normally you have things like yaw and pitch. Well, actually, that's all enabled as well. So if I load up, um, in this case, the Day of Defeat people use the same thing. So if I can remember where those are. Um, yeah, yeah, um, okay. Well, if you want to do multiple animations that are built on top of each other, uh, you can do that as well. Um, really, that's if you want to get into the nitty-gritty of um, controlling multiple animations, if you want to get into the nitty-gritty of, of kind of blending them yourself. That's kind of the strength of Source Filmmaker is that um, it's more about... Um, you know, animating on your own. You could still animate with blended animations that are pre-built, but generally speaking, you're going to be doing a lot of that with your own um, bits and pieces. So let me show you. Um, so if you import sequence, and if you choose a sequence that has um, uh, something with yaw, pitch, and roll kind of st uh, stuff, so... Uh, let's see. Here we go. Perfect. All right. Um, so you can actually manipulate the sliders a little bit to get the um, the movement that you want, and uh, even generate the root motion. So over time, it's going to move in that specific direction that um, you requested. Um, now, like. Let's say you wanted to manipulate the animation to where the arms also play a gesture, which I think is what you're talking about. Um, you would have to select just the arm um, functions there. So, like, let's say you did that and then that. And you can hold down Control and Shift and then click on bones to select multiple bones. You can also hold and drag to create a, a circular selection to get to grab even more if you'd like. Um, 
So you hit all those. Now you have the ARM selected. And if you import another sequence, and this is going to be over a specific amount of time, but um, let's see here. Maybe we can find a gesture that would work. Here we go. Perfect. Wave. So now, see that broke my root motion. <laughs> But it's not quite built in as readily as um, as um, face poser, if that's what you're comparing it to. This really isn't face poser. It's not designed to blend like a million pre-built animations. A lot of this is a lot of the meat and potatoes of Source Maker is when you have, a, you know, your own animations to build. I would say importing custom sequences is kind of a starting point, but it's not really what you want to do all of your animations off of. So let's see here. I'll just delete that. And to delete a character out of the scene or anything out of the scene, um, you right click and delete animation set. So what was I saying before? Got a little sidetracked. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll talk about um, camera settings. So I've been in the work camera for the most of the time, but if you hit the work camera button, it'll pop you back to scene camera. Now I can manipulate the scene camera since I had the camera selected. Let me try and find a slightly better position here. Now, the same thing applies with the Gary's Mod camera as in the camera tool. Uh, you have field of view, which is um, kind of like right click and drag. That's expressed as a slider here. And what you'll see is a whole selection of sliders that will be um, uh, to the right of the animation set editor where you have your selections. And every model is going to have, every, every object is going to have a different set of sliders that you can manipulate. Um, in ragdolls that have face posing, that is for each individual face pose that you'll have um, different sliders. For cameras and lights, you'll have a different set of sliders that control that particular object. These, of course, can be animated, but um, for the purpose of screenshots, you know, you can just get what you'd like. Now, let's say that. All right. Um, you can also control the focal distance, which is like super depth of field, SDOF. Um, that would be this slider, the second slider there where it says focal distance. Now, in this case, the focal distance is pretty good, but let's say you wanted the focal distance of this second umbrella back here. If you pull it all the way back, you're not even going to come close to reaching it. So what you're going to do is, and this works for, uh, I'd say, a uh, rough smattering of sliders, maybe like 50-50 shot, you can actually remap the slider range, which means that... Um, once you hit that, you'll get another pop-up box here that allows you to change the minimum and maximum amounts of that sliders as well as the default. So in this case, I usually set it to 2,000. That gives me a pretty good range. Now, when I uh, create uh, depth of field, it's going to load up where the center of that purple square is. But I want to put it back here. And the wider the slider is, the, the um, less fine the manipulation is. So if it's going to be close, you can even reduce it down to next to nothing if you'd like. Um, so let me get him on that guy's face. Um, your aperture controls how much depth of field. Um, so to preview how much blur that you're going to have, uh, you can actually go back to the clip editor, which is in the timeline view. And that's the first button. You'll get the actual screen to kind of give you a rough idea of what it's going to blur to. And you can see that um, change happen. So let's see here. Move the focal distance up to the astronaut. Now it's a little bit more blurred. You can boost the aperture a lot to see kind of where it's going. So let's see. Move him back over there. Uh, other camera controls that you have are a tone map scale. That actually controls the overall strength of the tone map, which is um, more or less the, the brightness. So let me just show you. So that gives you a few good options. By default, it's a little bit higher than what they consider the default. 
Um, what they sp what the camera spawns with is a pretty good option, um, but if you don't mind doing some post process brightness, or if you really want to manipulate your scene lights a lot, then that's also an option. Um, uh, alternatively, you have controls for bloom, which is pretty self explanatory. Um, if you don't like the source filmmaker bloom or source bloom in general, you can turn that off completely. Um, let's see here. Um, finally, in these lists, you also have the self-shading ambient occlusion, which um, is everything from the strength to the bias, which is how shallow or strong it is, to the radius, which is how um, how tight the actual rendered ambient occlusion is. Um, so if you want to see exactly what the um, what the ambient occlusion looks like, you can actually right click on the active viewport, go to the first option which is render settings, and then you have a few extra options here. Now when you actually render your screenshot you're going to want to make sure that these options are set as well. Um, you'll have depth of field, motion blur, subpixel jitter, ambient occlusion, uh, anti-lazing, and ambient occlusion controls. Um, the higher these settings, the longer it takes to render, but the better the quality. Um, you could set these normally when you're about to render a movie, but if you're exporting as a poster, then you're going to want to set these here because that's the only place you can do it. Uh, I would generally recommend if it's a if it's a rough production poster, 64 to 128 is good for depth of field, and 32 to 64 is good for motion blur. Of course, if you're doing something that you really want to have like maximum everything, then you know you can crank it up to your heart's content. Let's say if you really wanted to um, tweak the ambient occlusion, then what you're going to want to do is um, is select show ambient occlusion, and what that will do is basically turn your entire scene white. All the materials change to white except for the AO. Uh, you can actually manipulate the entire scene just doing this, and I've seen people actually render entire videos like this as kind of an art style. That was really popular when Source Filmmaker came out. Um, and you could see how ambient occlusion works a little bit more this way. So go back to the render settings and show ambient occlusion, and that turns it off. So let's say we have our pose pretty much down. We want to add lighting at this point. From here, you go to Add in the Animation Set Editor. You hit New Light. All right, the light, like a uh, ragdoll or like any model, will spawn where the camera is, and you'll have a manipulator here to control how to move your light around. Um, this can get a little bit tricky. It's easy to lose your light if, especially if you're in a dark area, uh, it, because you can only really see it based off of the effects it has on the scene. So if you were to move this around you kind of lose exactly where this is pointed. You know, there's no real way to say the light is here. You just have to manipulate it around until you see it again. There's a few ways to combat this. Uh, the easier way is to right-click on the light, and what you'll do is enable volumetrics, and that'll give you this nice light shaft god ray kind of effect, and from there you can move the light around. Um, uh, the volumetrics in Source Filmmaker are pretty popular to play with. They do add a very nice effect if they're used properly, um, but that's not always what you want in your scene. All right. Um, so let's see here. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the bottom viewport that I have. Uh, right. So let's say that's roughly where you want it. We can disable volumetrics. All right. Um, and what we're going to do is manipulate a few of the sliders on the light that are um, pretty important. You have field of view, which is how wide and how tall the light is. Um, also important is intensity, so you can tone down the intensity a bit, uh, so that way it doesn't blast everything. Um, and this slider you can definitely remap. 
Uh, you can also control the maximum and minimum distance of the light. So, like, let's say instead of just lighting actors, you want to light the entire environment. You can actually do that with one or two lights that have max distance set to basically maximum and far as the attenuation set to basically maximum as well as the far edge set to maximum. <clears throat> there are a few other uh, very interesting things that you could do with lights with shadows. And so in uh, Gary's mod, people run um, startup scripts that allow them to uh, reduce the shadow filter size. Here, it's basically set to a slider. You can get very, very sharp shadows with just a single slider pull. And um, you can get them as blurred as you'd like, so that way you can have a very subtle scene light. Um, also important is that you can color the light uh, using the red, green, blue sliders. Um, so maybe we can do that and reduce the intensity of this light a little bit. Add a second light. So what I'm going to do here is the other way that you can manipulate a light. So while you have your primary uh, camera selected, um, what you're going to do is lock your light to your camera and then move your camera around with the light. Now for this example, I'm going to create a secondary camera. That's camera two. That's plus sign, new camera. Now I'm going to go where I normally sw uh, toggle between my work camera and camera one. I'm going to choose the menu, go to change scene camera, and change it to camera two. Camera two spawns in the exact same position and settings of camera one, but it is a separate camera. So if you move it around a little bit, um, your old camera will be retained if you switch the cameras back. So you have your work camera and camera one. Um, what we're going to do with the light, however, is uh, lock the camera to the light, or if I actually lock the light to the camera. So if you expand the camera options and the light options, you'll see all the sliders that you normally have just expressed as uh, subgroups in your menu. Now what you're going to do is lock the light to the camera, which is you take the transform of your child of your parent and then drop it onto the child. Let me just double check that. Yes. So you take the transform, which is where your camera is or where your object is in the world, and you move it from the object that you want to have ch uh, as a child. So if this can be used for things like if you have a gun in the person's hand and you want to move the hand after the gun's been positioned, um, you can actually drag the hand's bone to the gun's root and then it will move the gun with the hand. Um, here I'm using it as um, a way to basically fly the light. So what I'm going to do here is now that the light is locked to the camera's transform, um, Every time that I move this camera, the light that I spawn is going to move with it. You can see that um, it's affecting the, uh, the, uh, the environment here in that sort of way, but it's not really centered. So what I'm going to do now is select the lights transform and hit and pull this slider called default. That's the first one on the procedural group, and I'm going to slide it all the way to one. What default does is if it's parented to a bone, it's going to move the rotation and position of the child to the parent, whatever the rotation is. I'll show you more examples of this in a little while, but when it comes to lights and cameras, it basically locks the light to the camera. All right. So now that I have my camera and my light locked, I'm basically flying with this second light as kind of a headlight. All right. So we'll set up a second light here. And we'll modify the light settings on the fly while it's still locked in. Uh, and we'll change this to a yellowish light. Maybe have this come from the sky as the sun. And now that I have my light placed, all I have to do to move the camera and not the light is unlock this little lock button. Boom. Done. Now I can move the camera around and the light will stay where it is. So I'm going to change my scene camera back to camera one. And now I have two lights in my scene that have been well placed. So 
Maybe adjust the settings a little bit with this. <coughs> oh, okay. And I can delete this camera if I don't like it. But generally I keep it as a second work camera in case I need to do um, uh, anything like that. Let's see here. Come on, everybody in. Okay. So now that I have two lights in my scene and two actors, all right, let's see here. I think that's the helmet. That's the whole helmet. Ah, oh, perfect. Well, mostly. Um, Another thing that you're going to want to manipulate in Source Filmmaker that you normally do in Gary's Mod is body groups and uh, skin groups. To do this, it's really simple. All you got to do is select the model that you want to change the body group or skin group of, right click on it, same menu, you'll go down to the second to last group and select skins or body groups and they select them out has a whole menu. So I'm going to give him a beret. And uh, let's see here. Maybe change that. And put the headset on. <coughs> All right. Okay. He looks absolutely ridiculous, but it's okay. So maybe we can have this guy here holding his helmet. And since the helmet's been um, grouped to a second, a second um, bone here that's separate, uh, I can move the, the helmet separately. So thanks. Hmm. Or not. <laughs> Looks like the helmet's been rigged to the, uh, the head. Let's see what my body group's option, options here. Visor. Up. Oh, perfect. Okay. And let's see here. Okay, so maybe I want to manipulate his uh, pose a little bit. Grab the head. Grab the view target, which is where he is looking on this in the scene. Maybe make it look like he's running from this crazy dude. I'm getting word. The visor is, in fact, rigged. That's the bar, the helmet. Maybe it's on the selection. Let's see here. Visor, outer joint. Oh, that's probably it. Might be the other body group. Let's see. Oh, yes, there we go. That's it. Thank you. Oh, man, did I lose it? Nope. And of course, you can manipulate the uh, entire model usually from the uh, from the uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yep. Let's see. <coughs>
Oh yeah. Now, now my real posing ability is quite obvious that I cannot pose, but <clears throat> it's okay. I'm not here to teach you how to pose. I'm here to teach you how to use Force Filmmaker. <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, we have placed lights. We have put elements in the scene. Um, let me add something like an uh, object for one of these guys to hold. So we're going to select new model. And um, let's see. Hmm. Just trying to look for a weapon that I know has um, bones to manipulate. I guess I can choose one of my own. Why not? Weapons. Uh, what's neat about this uh, this selection here is that um, if you add objects while you're in Source Filmmaker, you can simply hit rescan to rescan all your options. So if you create a mod on the fly, you can add that <coughs> afterwards. So um, yeah, let's give them a stare og. Why not? Notice uh, it spawns at the um, live camera. So what we're gonna do here is um, wow, not my best work, not at all. <laughs> all right, um, so we're gonna attach this rifle to this dude's hand. So if you select uh, another little thing that helps you out, if you select and bone in the scene, it will automatically open up all the submenus to get to that specific bone. So if you notice, as I select maybe this finger it opens up this whole menu here and you can clo close those as needed. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach the right hand the the rifle to the right hand of the uh, of the guy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the root transform of the rifle which moves the rifle around as a whole and I'm going to take the hand the actual selection of the hand drag it and then drop it onto the root transform now it is locked to the hand and it may not move until I select the slider but no, it does so now it's on there but it's in, not in the right spot the way that you fix this is you select the root transform of the thing you want to move like with the light and you're gonna hit default All right. and sometimes the actual root transform the uh, rotation might not be there nor the position but that's okay. You can manipulate where it is in relationship to the parent after you've moved it. So now that I have it locked, I can simply uh, position it where I'd like. All right. So uh, the animation that I imported already had the fingers more or less posed for a weapon. So let's see here. Boom. And I'm going to close that. And we're going to make it look like he's a madman, so he's firing the gun. No trigger discipline whatsoever. Kind of crazy. All right. And since the gun has um, proper bones and everything, you can manipulate those as well. Uh, that maybe. And when you have something that uh, that is at a weird angle, um, depending on the bone, uh, on the way that it was rigged, you'll actually have transform controls that allow you to move it as to where it was supposed to be in the first place without having to worry about um, where it is in the world. Um, that would be local transforms, not world transforms. So now that we have the rifle in there, you can see it's still a little bit off. So we're going to move it down just a little bit, maybe angle it just a little bit. All right. Now it's completely in the way of the guy's crazy face. You definitely want to see the crazy face. So we're going to move the arm. And because we locked the uh, the rifle in, it's lock it's gonna move with the hand, no problem. I think this is gonna be my best work ever. Like I'm pretty sure it's gonna go down in history. Okay, 
So there we go. We have our work of art. <laughs> the best model pose, I think, that has ever been made in Source Filmmaker. All right, let's see. Well, <clears throat> now that we are definitively done, well, maybe we won't. Maybe actually we want to move it over just a little bit. Maybe I don't like the background. I want to give it that one because it's a little bit more interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select multiple animation sets. <clears throat> um, this is something that's pretty powerful. You don't realize how powerful it is until you need to do it, and then you realize this is awesome. So let's say you want to move this whole scene over by maybe just a few meters or something like that. You select every single object in the scene, all right, including lights and the camera, and the camera lasts because you want to want to move it based off where the camera is, and you simply manipulate it. And there you go. That's your whole scene that's getting moved around, or in this case, rotated. Maybe not prettily. See here. Hmm. Of course, you know, I don't always recommend doing something this dramatic at this point, but it shows the power that this, uh, this program has. There we go. So notice the, uh, the lighting's a little bit off because of the tone map scale. Um, so if we were to boost that up a bit to get the sky background done, you see how bright our lights actually are. Now, I would probably make these modifications in post to get the light back up. Um, I wouldn't exactly say that this was something that I was planning on doing in this outdoor environment, but the basic idea is there. You know, you can really manipulate things how you'd like. Um, you know, because we're pointed against away from the sun, now the, now the lighting's a little bit more dramatic. So, let's see here. Uh, maybe we can add a separate light. Can't believe I'm really trying to tweak this scene out, given how ridiculous it is. Uh, let's see. And maybe give it a third color. Because of random red lights, right? They're awesome. All right. Well, great. Um, maybe I can give the pilot a little bit of emotion. And to do that, I select on the face, and they split up the face flexes in three groups. That's upper, mid, and lower face, as well as the eyes. Let's see here. And that is going to be... Well, let's play around a little bit. Unfortunately, these sliders cannot be remapped, which I hate. I really wish these worked. Um, boy, that would be awesome. <coughs> but no. So now it looks like, boy, this guy, he's in a lot of trouble. So now that we have the poster ready to go, we're going to do a few things. Of course, you're going to want to save more often than I do, but you're going to save as um, uh, crazy man. Dot DMX. And at this point, you have two options to make this an actual image. You can either export as a poster or you can export as a movie. 
Now, if you export as a poster, you get some very nice options. You have the option to um, to save the directory, um, save the name of it. That'd be the last thing on it. And you could save that as um, any size that you'd like, 1920 by 1080, uh, 3840 by 2160. Yes, since I started using Source Maker, I memorized what 4K is. And that will always export as an uncompressed target, despite what you click up here. Um, you hit Export Poster, and it's going to use the camera settings that we had before that we selected with the right click onto the viewport. So it's going to be 64 samples of whatnot. Um, at this size, it's going to be 16 tiles, so it's going to take a few minutes to load. Um, this gives you this is going to work for most of your shots, but if you're really going to want quality, you're going to want to ha export it as a PFM movie. Um, and you're going to only export a single frame of that film. What that's going to give you is at 4K, it's going to be a 96 megabyte image that you can load up into Photoshop. It has a 32 bit color depth, which is basically HDR or um, what comes out of. Uncompr uh, uncompressed image data that normally comes out of like high-end cameras. Um, from there you can actually run it through HDR options in Photoshop and generate some very impressive looking effects. Um, once this uh, uh, finishes rendering I'll show you what that does. So boom that's done. I now have a, full, a um, poster in the save file which is by default user mods elements renders. So crazy man. Let me boot up Photoshop. And there it is. Got the image at beautiful, beautiful 4K. And of course this we can clean up and you know do all the adjustments and all that kind of stuff. Hooray! All right, not saving that. Now, the other option is to export as a PFM file. That's export movie. All right. Now we have a few different options. Here we can manually select the uh, amount of progressive refinement. We can also draw um, external entities and other things like that. Not that important in this case. Um, what you're going to want to do here is export it as an image sequence, which is in that first option. If you have Photoshop and Camera Raw, then I highly recommend PFM. If not, you can export it as TGA, but there's no benefit of this versus the TGA that you'll get as a poster. So <clears throat> if you're really crazy about this shot and you really want to give it the best treatment, then you're going to do it as a PFM. You can actually do two things here. You can um, get the PFM, which is the, the color image, and then you can get a depth file, which is a grayscale image that automatically generates, that gives you the depth of the scene. And I'll generate it to show you. So here it's going to be at 720p, and you won't have the option to do anything higher. Excuse me. So you talk for an hour and you're, you kind of get uh, sore. Um, to change that to get a full 1080p shot or 2160p shot, um, you'll need to change a command line in the Source Maker boot. So I'll show you that uh, like one reboot to kind of give you an idea what that is. But for now, we're going to export movie. Oh, oh, missed one very, very, very important thing. <laughs> so we're going to export the movie. Yeah, we're going to save. Now, notice I stopped it because it was going to generate a 60-second sequence of this still image. You're going to want to select Custom, change it to Frames, and choose 0 to 1. That will generate the first frame in the shot. Now, if you want to do some animation... The neat thing about Source Maker, because it's a non-real-time renderer, if you have something that moves very fast in the scene, 
it will have individual motion blur. So like let's say you have a dude flapping his arms, it will have um, motion blur on the arms uh, as if it was in a, uh, as if it was a moving image. <coughs> you can actually take advantage of this um, to simulate motion in your scene if you really want to get into animating later on. That's how you do it normally. But for screenshots, you can give it a really interesting kind of pseudo animation. I'm not going to really go into animation stuff, so I'm just saying that it's something that you can do. Um, so I, now that I have 0 to 1 frame selected, I export the movie, overwrite the layoff that I just started creating, boom, it's done. That goes into, by default, user mod elements sessions and whatever you called it. So this is crazy, man. And it unfortunately created like three frames of the same thing, so I'm just going to delete those. So this is something that you'll only be able to open up in Photoshop, like I said. If you created the depth map, you'll get this uh, RGB depth map. Um, you also get your whole image here. Now, like I said, this is something that's in 32-bit color mode, so you're going to want to hit 8 bits per channel to do any kind of modification in Photoshop. That actually gives you this option to, um, to do all kinds of HDR toning and scaling. Um, this can take a lot of time to really get good, you know, to really get where you want it. Um, but if you take the time, if, you know, you're serious about it, you know, you could take the extra time to really get that effect that you'd like. Um, you can also in create the glow through here. And that actually gives you a much, much more dynamic image than what you would have out of your um, target export. <coughs> no, I'm not going to save that. All right, so let me save, and I'll show you two things when I reopen Source Filmmaker. One. We're going to open Recent. The first one is always going to be the last thing that you made. It's going to reload. I'm going to have to load up the map and everything. And notice, our scene changed just a little bit. Our crazy dude here has gotten his control groups back. Like I said, that's a common issue that we have. So... If you notice, when I'm moving around with the clip editor enabled, that's this thing right here. That's what it opens by default. I can't modify any of these models. I just get an information on the model itself. All right. Um, and to do any modifications, I have to switch back to the um, motion editor or the keyframe editor. So now that this dude is actually doing what he's supposed to be doing, we're going to kind of give him... Maybe not a crazy face this time, but at the very least, make him look a little angry. So let's say I want to have him looking directly at the pilot. I can express that by parenting the um, <coughs> the eyes of the, um, the dude in the back to the dude in the front. So actually I want to grab the head, this guy, slap it on the view target here, default. And boom, now if I were to move this guy around a bit, the eyes will track the guy and maybe move him back a little bit. Why not? All right, and that, and let's give him some expression. Uh, maybe not as comedic as it was before, but it does the trick.
I don't know what's going on with that hand. Yeah, there is no concern for how the physics model is set up. As a matter of fact, you don't even need it. But, um, you know, just keep in mind that you have the power to completely break your model. You know, you can do some really crazy stuff if you want. Uh, hmm. And I forgot to set the launch options. Beautiful. So save it again. <laughs> so <clears throat> in order to get higher uh, movie rendering settings, we're going to go to Properties in Source Filmmaker. That's, um, you know, in the games viewer here. We're going to set launch options. <clears throat> we're going to create a launch option that gives us a new resolution for the Source Filmmaker renderer. This... Uh, resolution is directly tied into the maximum rendering resolution of um, the movie output. So we're going to change, and that is expressed as dash SFM underscore resolution, and we're going to change it to 2160 for 4K, actually 3840. <clears throat> I usually set mine to 1920 by default. That's, um, you know, 1080p. So what this is going to do is going to reboot Source Filmmaker. You will see a very significant drop in your performance. And I mean very significant. You also get this warning that will say that um, your game window is smaller than the SFM render resolution. That's fine. Um, don't worry about it. But it gives you an idea that it's outside of the normal range. Um, and where I was getting about 40 to 50 frames per second on that map before, I'll probably get about maybe 10 at most. Uh, lots of stuttering. See, I can, well, get pretty decent here, but you can actually manipulate that to um, to your advantage. If you're having a really hard time loading a map, you can turn it all the way down to like, well, anything you'd like, maybe like 480 or something. Uh, let's see here. Export. Now we're going to export a movie. Now that we have it at, running at a higher thing, we have the option to go all the way up to 2160p. So this time we're going to export it <coughs> You'll get your entire uh, frame loaded, uh, your entire screen loaded up. And since it's a one frame movie, it's done. Now, when I load it, it's 97 megabytes. And there we go 32 bit 4K image. And quite impressive. And you're probably going to want to close Source and Maker once you're done with this. Quit. Done. Change your launch options back <laughs> to my default of 1920. Boom. Close. Okay. So Source Maker is ready for another day. And it's. Yeah, this takes a little bit of getting used to to figure out exactly how you want this, but trust me, it is vastly superior in certain shots. Um, as a matter of fact, I could pull up an example. <coughs> so, um, that's a PFM, not that impressive. Okay. Here we go, perfect. Uh, this is a 32-bit PFM that I manipulated to look like that, just using those uh, lower uh, bit resolution uh, stuff there. Um, and, of course, you get a nice depth map as well. Um, that's about it for the overall uh, stuff for Source Maker. I went from booting up the program to rendering an image. Um, there are, of course, a few issues that you can have with it. Um, not every model that you're going to load works uh, perfect, obviously. Um, if you load up a map that isn't, um, you know, full color, then it's not going to work well. Um, 
Sometimes you can even put in a model in uh, that will completely crash um, Source Film Maker as a whole. Uh, let me actually crash SFM just to give you an idea. Um, so maybe I can load up. Uh, Um, there you go, perfect. Uh, I'll load up any Obsidian Conflict map just to give you an idea what it looks like when there is absolutely no um, no HDR, and it's you you can't use these maps at all. Um, other things that you'll see are issues with cube maps. Now that's a little bit trickier. You can either disable them completely, which it, which you can enter in the oh wow seriously. I try and find a map that is not HDNR enabled, and I think I pull up the only map that is HDNR enabled. Beautiful. I can unload a map and reload a new map on the fly as well. So let me have a better look. Wow, I just I can't believe that. Here we go. OC Zelda O2. I can almost guarantee this is not HDMR. HDI. <laughs> HDR. Um, broken cube maps are a bit more insidious of a problem. Uh, the only way to um, fix that is to load them up in a different branch of the engine. Wow. This one complete. Here we go. See, this is what pops up. Uh, the maps missing HDMR light maps, and boom, there are no light maps. It is just straight up full bright. But it's all there, just unusable. Um, broken cube maps can be fixed by loading up um, the map in Alien Swarm, provided that you have all the assets ready to go. Um, Alien Swarm Portal. Team Fortress 2, you can load up the, the map in those games and run build cube maps. That's a bit tricky because you actually have to load that map into, um, the, you have to load up all the models and textures and everything that map needs into the game as well. So that can get very messy and very big. Um, alternatively, you could just turn them off of map specular zero. Um, sometimes you'll hit models with transparency issues. Uh, that will be pretty obvious. Um, I don't think I have anything offhand that I could show you, but um, you'll see that the ambient occlusion for the model will bleed right through. Um, the only way to fix that is to have the model recompiled with the correct parameters. Um, you can actually do that yourself if you're, um, you know, savvy enough. But a lot of times, that's another issue with uh, assets and whatnot. Um, Sometimes you can make modifications to a model and change the bone structure, and it will throw Source Filmmaker off. But when you reload that save, all you need to do is right-click on the model itself in the Animation Set Editor, and um, and hit uh, Rebuild Control Groups, and that's pretty. It works pretty well most of the time. So if I load up a save. Maybe I can open up a more um, substantial project to kind of give you an idea. Um, <laughs> See, I'm terrible at naming my uh, my stuff here. It's kind of a um, here we go. Um, this is a little bit more advanced of a uh, of a scene. This has everything properly posed and lit, and it also uses a um, particle effect. If you really want to get into particle effects, um, you can actually load them up from games as you would any model or texture or map, um, and you can actually apply them. I use the uh, the um, Counter Strike Global Offensive particles for uh, muzzle flash in this case. Um, as you can see, you start to get a little bit messy on the side here. Uh, boom, done. Okay. Ah, perfect. All right. So, um, in the work camera. And let's see here. 
move this camera around a little bit. Actually, let's move around camera one. All right. So this is using pretty much all the models that I've made, more or less, plus one other one. Um, so if you notice, this gun here, completely messed up. I've changed the, uh, the bone structure of this model a few times since I've done this. So all I need to do is select the model itself, um, and utilities, hopefully this will work, so it doesn't make me look like a fool, reattached model, boom. Even with the new bone structure, it loads up quite well. And I can manipulate the bones on all this, of course. You know, whatever. And if you notice, there's some lighting on the guy. If you actually play the scene back, you could see that there's um, quite a few particle effects going on here. And that's these... Um, these different uh, red effects over here. So I believe in this case I rendered frame two, or this frame, whichever it is. Um, so you have this whole three-dimensional particle effect. They also had some giving effect on this guy. But there's a lot you can do with Source Maker that you just, just can't do with Gary's Mod, as much as I love it for nostalgic reasons. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, that's pretty much the uh, the whole of it. Oh, of course, this also has um, nice uh, dynamic lighting and god rays and whatnot. And even though it looks a little messy right now, uh, it renders out just just beautifully. And this is maybe I can find it in here. Oh, yeah. This was called. Pass. Nope. Oh well. <laughs> I think I might have saved that as a poster. I guess not. <laughs> All right. But the basic principles there. I think um, that pretty much does it from start to finish. Um, if anybody that's been watching has any questions, now would be a good time to ask. Okay, well, I guess I'll cut it here. I'm going to try and upload this to YouTube uh, if you feel like watching like a two-hour video. Um, apparently, that's possible. So um, hopefully, I'll be able to link it later. I uh, hope you learned something today. That's the hope. Um, and uh, you enjoyed it. All right. Thanks for watching.